Hi, Madeline. Hi, how's it going, Cindy? Good, how are you? Doing good, thanks. Thank you so much for having me join Thoughts from a Page tonight. I really appreciate it. We're so glad you're here. We've all been raving about your book. Oh, well, thank you. I very much appreciate that. <laughs> Well, we're, we're thrilled to pieces that you're joining us. And um, I guess the first thing we were talking about that we spent a while talking about was how well researched it is and all of these facts that we learned that we have not read about in any other World War II book. So can you talk a little bit about that? And I know you just got back from another research trip, which I'm assuming is for an upcoming novel. So we can talk about that later as well, but, but kind of where you stumbled across, like what Portugal was like during the war and the resistance pamphlets and you know how you got the idea to Kind of put it all together. Well, thank you very much. Um, to be honest with you, I am a 100% history nerd and I am a total research dork. Like I could lose myself in history so many times over and just be completely happy. Um, so whenever I do a, a new book, I try to get as much research as possible. Um, and I've also been incredibly fortunate to get to travel on site to, well, um, like, you know, contemporary on site, obviously, um, to all of the various places. So when I did the research for the last, or for, sorry, for the librarian spy, I did get to go to um, DC. I got to actually visit the Library of Congress, which I had never been to before. And I mean, wow, it is truly, truly breathtaking for those of you who may not have had a chance to go, definitely try to if you guys are ever in DC. Um, I also got to go to Lisbon, Portugal, and also to Lyon, France. Um, and, you know, whenever I, whenever I do travel for my books, I try really hard not to take public transportation. I try to actually, so it really is like 22,000 steps a day that I end up walking because, um, and I, I do use my iPhone a lot for maps because I am horrible with my sense of direction. But by the time I end up leaving, I've really walked in the shoes of those characters. I've gotten to go down the street. So when I'm writing that they go from, you know, Rue de Platte to Rue de Sol, I can see it in my head, those exact turns that I'm taking. Um, and so for me, I feel like that really does help just bring the story to life. But even outside of that, I really do just comb through tons and tons of nonfiction books. Um, admittedly, I will say Portugal was very difficult. <laughs> There's a lot of information out there about the French resistance. Um, a lot of it is geared toward um, Paris, which is, you know, a huge focal point for a lot of people, I think, as far as fiction and even nonfiction goes. Um, but Lyon was actually the capital of the French resistance, which I didn't know about until I started writing this book. Um, and so, you know, it really was interesting that there aren't more stories set in Lyon, like for my opinion, um, especially with the Tribules, which uh, are these covered passageways that connect all of these buildings. So you could enter from one street and you could exit three streets over, which like was just such an incredible thing to get to walk in those and, and see them. And I actually have a couple of videos that I've um, either I've posted them or I will, I know I'll definitely be posting them as time goes on. Um, but it's just, it's so, it's been such an incredible journey for me to get to read a lot of these firsthand accounts um, and also to get to see, uh, like for example, I went to the Resistance Museum in Lyon, France, and I actually got to see the printing press that was used by the woman who I modeled Elaine after, who was a real woman who existed during the French Resistance named um, Lucienne Gosniak. And, uh, and just getting to actually see it in person and be like, oh my gosh, this is the Minerve. Like this is, this is the printing press that she used. And it just completely blew my mind. So, um, and then actually when I was in Portugal, um, my tour guide had a grandmother who was 101 years old and she remembered what life was like during when all of the refugees were coming into uh, Lisbon. And, uh, and so that was incredible because it really kind of opened up these conversations between, um, her name was Raquel and uh, her grandmother, and they would kind of talk about what her life was then. And, and it was something they had never really talked about before. So it was, it was great because I got to get that information, but, but so did Raquel, and that was a really cool thing. I just thought that was so interesting about Lisbon because and we were all talking that none of us knew what it was like during the war and that there wasn't rationing and you know how everybody was operating there and then even Ava's job that was so fascinating to me like I didn't know that was something someone was doing. 
Yeah, it was really fascinating. I mean, they were going to all of these different bookshops. And, and like I said, even these stationery stores would really have a lot of information because all of these, uh, like if you think about it, it was really one of the very few spots um, in Europe that was neutral. So you had so many refugees that were coming into this location. And it really was just like I said in the book, this interminable wait where you know you had all these different visas and you had these different hoops that you had to jump through. And unfortunately, a lot of these countries were intentionally stymieing these people because they had so many, like they had their, their limitations of amount of refugees that they would let in. But of course, during war, nobody wants to say, oh, well, we're capping our refugees because that's not good press. So they would just find all of these like red tape loopholes or uh, these like red tape, um, you know, bureaucratic stops that people could go ahead and put in place that would keep these people from being able to finally get to escape um, Lisbon. And um, so with everybody there, of course, with them, they bring all of the literature from their home countries. And that that comes in the form of, you know, anything from from like these manuals, like I said, like a manual of how a fan is built, you know, these these crazy little sort of things. But then you also have these underground newspapers that people bring with them as well. And all of those end up on these newsstands. And it really is very widely circulated. Um, in fact, for uh, I don't know if you guys are 007 fans, but um, those books were actually based off of how life was in Lisbon during World War II. Um, so that's very much how, you know, the spies were very, very thick. Uh, they were from all different countries. And unfortunately, the American librarian spies that were sent over were woefully unprepared. Um, they were kind of like thrown into the belly of the beast and it was sort of a sink or swim situation. And uh, they kind of had to make the best of, of it. And, you know, sometimes they made some mistakes and sometimes, um, you know, they were able to find some really good stuff. And at the end of it, they had tons and tons and tons um, of information for America to have to comb through in the libraries back home. Yes, it certainly sounded like it. And I guess the microfiche, that was the way they did that most of the time because the ships were either getting stopped or bombed or whatever. Right. So, um, you know, with, with uh, Portugal being neutral and, and really... Um, I didn't appreciate how much it takes to really maintain that neutrality in a war, especially with a force like Hitler, you know, like with the Nazis, but he, like the fact that their, um, like Salazar was able to maintain this neutrality is really incredible. And part of that was having to make sure that he was really strict with all of the different countries who were in his country. So for example, with America, you know, if they were trying to send over all of these German books to America, on these ships, they're being confiscated as contraband because they're like, why are you sending all of this German literature to America? This doesn't seem like it's, it's a good thing because they have to maintain their neutrality. Um, and so they were able to do these Pan Am clippers where they could do this microfiche where they would take all these pictures of these old cameras, which by the way, researching what the right camera was took about three weeks oh, wow. <laughs> and I even had a camera expert that uh that I reined in and he was doing research um on the side for me as well uh, but I got the right one <laughs> and so um the one that they like because it never said in the research I was looking at which camera they used so I had to see what would be a a likely camera that they would have used um and so they would take those those microfiche images and they would send them back. And um, it was also very difficult then because, you know, everybody was going through, you know, really aside from, from like Lisbon and the other neutral countries, um, the rationing. And so even finding celluloid film to be able to put the microfiche on was even difficult. So they had to, even though they had to photograph all of these things, you know, they also still had to technically be careful with what they were photographing. So it was like a really delicate balance. <laughs> a puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, does anybody want to ask any questions? I have a bunch, but I want to make sure everybody gets to ask. Okay, Michelle, go right ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I just finished this the novel like 20 minutes ago. So <laughs> I'm like fresh into the storyline. But um, I was curious how you determined when um, Ava and Elaine's story were going to intersect because... I mean, obviously I knew that that was coming, 
but you know, I kept glancing down, oh my gosh, 50%, when is it going to happen? And is that, did that happen organically or was that something that was predetermined as part of your plotting? Um, well, I'm a very, very thorough plotter. I like to joke that I'm type A, 12 point times New Roman font. Um, so it definitely was plotted out beforehand, but it also had a lot to do with logistics. So, you know, during World War II, you really didn't have, like an American just couldn't go to France, for example. Um, and especially with Ava's position, she was more of a librarian spy. She was not like a special agent. So she didn't have the training. She wouldn't have had the authority. She would not have had any way that she possibly could have gone to France um, unless I completely redesigned her character. Uh, and, and I don't even know that they would even take somebody who was a librarian to try to make into an active spy to go into France. Um, and then likewise, you know, Elaine, she, I don't think that she would have ever left the resistance to go to Lisbon because in her mind, I think that would have been almost like quitting. You know what I mean? Like they, she was needed there. Um, being a typographer, really working with the printing press, that was a very, very specialized skill. Um, so in Lyon, it really was like the printing capital of, the, uh, of France during the Renaissance period. Um, and so you have a lot of people who have a lot of talent with putting together words and, and like, you know, sculpting these beautiful articles, really, um, you know, inciting a lot of like uh, of pride for France and getting people to come. But to find the people who did the technical aspect of it, like the printing, that was very difficult. Um, so I definitely like for me, I don't think her character would have ever given up her position with the printing press to go to Lisbon. So unfortunately, it really was something that they kind of had to wait till the end to be able to go to. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see now um, some sort of board behind you that is oh, yeah. <laughs> probably a, a very geometric plotting situation. <laughs> it's, actually, it's, it's actually my quarterly goals. So I have like my, okay. it's like, it's my, my quarterly goals, the middle is what I'm working on and the bottom is um, what I've finished. So yeah, I always, I'm also, I always choose a huge bite of what I plan on doing at the quarter. So the bottom is never really as fully completed as I would like, but you know, aim for the, aim when they say aim for the moon and you'll land among the stars kind of thing. So yeah. <laughs> well, I'm impressed. Thank you for uh, answering the question. Oh, thank you so much for asking. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other, the interesting thing I think about that as their stories are slowly coming together, there were a lot of parallels you know, they both had things that were kind of hanging over them, like um, Elaine was worried about her husband, Joseph. Ava was worried about her neighbor. Um, they both, you know, were slowly getting involved in something they hadn't been involved in before. I just felt like there was a lot of parallels in their lives, even though they were very different. Thank you. Yeah. And that was um, entirely by design. I really did want them because I didn't you know, when I was first sort of conceptualizing this story, I was like, these people aren't going to be able to meet till the end. So what is going to really be the connection aside from, you know, Sarah and her son? And so, you know, it really was like, okay, well, what can I do to make these women similar, but still different? Um, and actually, when I wrote the book, the interesting thing is that um, I plotted them individually, um, and then I spliced them together to send over to my editor. So when I sent it to him to look over, I was like, okay, there are two plots here. One is individually and then one is together. So you can look at whatever one you would like. And when I wrote them, I completely wrote, um, which one did I do first? I did Elaine's first and then I did Ava's next. And then um, I used a, a cause I'm a, I have use a, a program that is outside of Word and you can actually move around the chapters. Uh, and I literally just inserted every other chapter and then I read through the whole thing to make sure that <laughs> everything worked. But there was almost like two individual stories uh, that I threaded together, but I had plotted it thoroughly beforehand. So I knew like, you know, they were both going to be joining uh, the resistance and, um, you know, the SOE, or I'm sorry, the IDC network together. And then they were, they were going to have, you know, this happen around the same time and this happened around the same time. And so it was, it was, I was very excited to see that it worked out as well in my head in reality, <laughs> because I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit nervous while I was writing it, thinking like, oh man, I really hope this works. And then I read through it in its entirety and I was like, okay, it's good. <laughs> 
Well, and I think a lot of times what happens to me when I'm reading dual timeline or dual narrative is that I'll really like one better than the other and I'll be really anxious to get back to the other one that I like the best. But in this one, I really felt like I was so happy to read both their stories that I didn't have that pull toward one or toward the other. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. Thank you. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a huge, huge reader. And for me, um, you know, with writing this book, even as I was conceptualizing it, I was thinking, I wonder which character people are going to like more. Um, and so, you know, I really tried to see how I could make each of the individual characters really have something, you know, something either endearing or like that people would really respect about them. And, and hopefully kind of make them both very appealing characters. So hearing you say that really means so much more to me than, than I can even tell you, so thank you. Oh, sure, and just both storylines were so fascinating, you know, which I thought really kept my attention. But anybody else have any questions? Again, I don't wanna monopolize. Um, Lynette? Yeah, um, the title of the book, The Librarian Fight, I also got the feeling at one point, I we, we were talking earlier and I said, I just thought, okay, we have two separate storylines going on because it did take quite a while for them to connect. So how did the title come about? Because it seems to be only about Ava, but Elaine's story is, is really pivotal. I mean, she, she's really a part of the story as well without, I feel like it takes both of them right. to make Oh, absolutely. Um, I have a very unromantic answer for that, and it's marketing. <laughs> uh, you know, the marketing department came back. Initially, it was going to be called the American, um, the American Librarian, which I felt at least fit Ava's perspective a lot more because she's certainly no consummate spy. I mean, she really is a sort of stumbling, bumbling. Like, if I were to suddenly be taken and put into a spy situation, I would be the one putting the shoes on the wrong feet and talking to the wrong people, you know, and doing a lot of the same mistakes that she did, which, you know, obviously made her character a little easier to write, imagining myself being her. Um, but, you know, I, I initially, even the cover concepts only um, had just Ava and nothing about Elaine. Um, and so, you know, I actually had to go back a couple of times and be like, can we please include something about Elaine? Because she really is such a huge part of the story. Um, and so now we have, you know, the beautiful cover concept that we, that we have now that, that ended up being the winner. Um, but yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> I wish I could have changed the, the, the title, but, but at least I won the cover. So I'm going to just go with that win. <laughs> And I was so happy with the cover because they're not facing away. <laughs> so I was right. like, yay! <laughs> so, yeah, there was definitely uh, yeah. some discussion about that as well. So I showed it to a couple of my author friends and they're like, oh, you can see their faces? And I was like, the scandal, right? <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> uh, anybody else have a question they want to ask? No, okay, well, I'll keep going. Um, I just wanted to make sure if anybody did, just let me know. Um, so you mentioned a little bit that you thought it was easier to write Ava, but, but which character did you, one, find easier to write and two, identify with more, Elaine or Ava? Um, I think I actually identified more with Ava um, just because she is more of my personality type. Um, I am, I am, you know, I wrote Elaine's character as being more impulsive and um, like quick to anger and, you know, things like that. And that is definitely not my character. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, unfortunately, kind of like two left feet like Ava. <laughs> um, but you know, as far as which character I really felt like I connected with, um, I almost have to really say Elaine, just because I feel like um, when somebody is in it in a much more like they have their stakes are higher, and I feel like they're in a much more dangerous position. It's so much easier to like sink into their emotions. I think more than somebody who's sort of entering a new environment and and being a fish out of water, so to speak, and having to find their way. Um, and so, uh, so for me, I guess I kind of had, like I said, the connection with Ava, but then as far as the, the sort of depth of understanding and, and that would be more Elaine. So. Well, and Elaine's story is just, I mean, it's a wonderful story, but it's sad. And so was that hard at times? Like, would you come away from writing and sort of feel like it was kind of hanging over you? Oh, it definitely was incredibly sad. Um, and especially, I don't recall if you guys, did you guys have an author's note in the back? when you read yeah. it. Okay. 
Um, so with with uh, Elaine's story, she's actually based off of a real, loosely based off of a real person named um, Lucienne Gozniak. And she, um, I was reading about her um, before I actually really got the idea for Lisbon, I was reading about her and I was like, wow, this woman's story would be like amazing to write. And so when I was working on Lisbon, the Lisbon side of things, um, so I love to really incorporate factual history into my book as far as events and use those events as turning points in my plot. Um, and, you know, with Lisbon, there was no real, like, huge turning point in, a, in the country to really dictate the plot. And so, um, so when I was thinking about it, I thought, oh, gosh, I read about that incredible woman in France, and she worked with a printing press. I bet I could have something going on with code work and, and have them sort of uh, meet, you know, have, like, like, this common goal, which is Sarah and Noah, and, and like, kind of make them meet that way. Um, so with her story, you know, with Lucienne, she actually really did give her identity papers to a Jewish woman who looked like her to save her. And then she had no identity papers. Um, she was married, um, but she, her husband lived through the war. Like they, you know, everything was perfectly fine. But this woman was such a plucky woman and she was so incredibly brave. And like, even at the end of the war, when a lot of the women were having their heads shaved for being collaborators with the Nazis, she stood up for them and she received retribution from people until one of her friends came up and was like, she's been with the resistance this whole time. Oh, sorry, my husband and my daughter just got home. Um, but he's like, you know, like she's been with the resistance this whole time, like leave her alone. But I mean, she, the whole thing that happened with um, the printing press when the Nazis and the Gestapo came in uh, and they attacked everybody. And um, I mean, and, and unfortunately, you know, everybody did die and she was the only survivor of that attack and she really did get shot. And she woke up in the hospital and she was able to be smuggled out. So, I mean, all of that was real. Um, and, and just, I mean, such an incredible woman. And, and even unfortunately, Manon, oh my gosh, her story was real also. <laughs> Oh, really? Um, I, I, I know. And I, I don't know that she ever joined the resistance. It was just a small little blip about this woman who was arrested and whose baby was left at home. Um, and it just, it absolutely just broke my heart. And so I, I felt like, I kind of felt like her story needed to be known, you know what I mean? And so I, that's why I put that in there as well. And, and it is incredibly heartbreaking, but I think I think so much of these are the stories that we need to always have forefront in our minds to remember so that like, this can never happen again. So, so yeah, it was, it was definitely tough to write some of those scenes. And I mean, I'm telling you, if you cried, I can tell you right now, like I was full on crying. <laughs> so, well, they were just so brave and, you know, the way that whole, all of that worked and uh, uh, dissembling the printing press and then reassembling it. And we were talking about how loud it was. And that was something, you know, we hadn't thought through that it was, you know, to operate, it was making so much noise and to be able to actually distribute the pamphlets. Like it was one of those things I knew that there had been resistance pamphlets, but I'd never thought about the printing of them and the distribution of them. Yeah, it was, it was really incredible. And that whole thing, how it worked out was exactly how um, I actually found a confession by her um, that were not a confession, but sort of like her firsthand account um, like a journal it all written in French. And so I had um, a friend of mine translate it for me and it detailed out like how all of the pieces of that printing press were kept in three different garages and they were all brought to Rue de Viella and they put them all together and they had the two presses I mean, all of it. Um, yeah, it, it really was all really on point with how it worked in history. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, for me, it's, it's like researching all of that and then being able to, to like, it comes to life in my brain, you know what I mean? And so being able to put that on the page, it, it really is something so very special to me. So, and especially knowing that you guys enjoyed the book so much, I, that really is very, very special to me. So thank you. Is it hard to pare down, like when you do this research and you have a million different facts and they all seem so cool, is it hard to not just info dump all in the book? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, you know, it's funny that like you had said, I had, I had recently done a trip to Warsaw, Poland for my next book, which is called The Keeper of Hidden Books. And, um, and you know, with that, that probably is even more so because it is such a huge story to tell. It's, you know, all the different things that happened. And when I sent it to my editor for him to look over my plot, he's like, 
Wow, I'm a little bit worried about how long this book is going to be <laughs> because there's a lot here. And I was like, I know, and I promise I'll try to keep it contained. Um, but, you know, it really is, it's hard to, because you do research so many amazing things and also so many heroes that really existed during that time, like the people who really just, who, who sacrificed so much to save people that they didn't even know. And it's so hard to not include all of those names and all of those events. Um, there is one particular person who is, uh, who is um, from Lisbon, who I mention in my author's note, um, and that's, um, his last name is Mendez, and my brain is like escaping me right now because I've, I've, I've just been to Warsaw, so I have all that, that research humming in my brain, um, Sousa, Sousa Mendez, um, and he was actually in um, Bordeaux, and he was the uh, Portuguese consulate there. And Salazar told him, no more refugees. You can't sign any more of these visas allowing refugees to come in. And Sousa Mendez said, I don't care. I'm going with my heart. And he signed and he signed and he signed. I think it was for three days. And he let thousands of refugees through. So they actually have the Sousa Mendez Foundation today where tens of thousands of people are, uh, are, are these survivors, uh, these children and grandchildren of the people who Sousa Mendez saved. Now, Sousa Mendez happened, you know, that whole incident happened about two years prior to my book starting. And I tried so hard to figure out how to incorporate that into my plot, but I couldn't because it really wouldn't, it would feel like an information dump. Oh, and then there was Sousa Mendez who blah, 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 <laughs> you know, and unfortunately that would so much be you know, an information dump. So I did at least uh, mention him in my author's note because I mean, you know, his, his, like what he did was, was so commendable. And unfortunately he died in abject poverty. I mean, he was completely ostracized because of that act and he suffered for it his whole life. Um, but he saved so many thousands of lives. So yeah, it is, it is really, really hard <laughs> to pick and choose what goes in. And even after it's published, I'm like, oh, I should have mentioned, you know, that one thing or, or oh yeah, I forgot to put that in too, you know, yeah. <laughs> I can see that would be hard, but you put in all sorts of great facts and I feel like I learned a ton, but there's gotta just be so many cool stories that you can't incorporate. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, and the funny thing is, um, my editor likes me to keep books at around 100,000 words. And so when I sent it to him, I said, well, it's like 105. Um, and I tried really hard to trim it down. And he's like, oh, no worries. You know, I'll take care of the last 5,000. I'll find a place. Um, and then he didn't. <laughs> so I guess he liked it being 105 as well. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad. <laughs> so, but I know, well, with, I know with my next book, he definitely wants me to, to be a little bit more attentive. <laughs> well, but you know, you may do the same thing and he'll be like, it's okay. I can't trim anything down. Yeah, that's kind of honestly what I'm expecting. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just keep adding to it each time. Yeah, well, exactly. um, Heather is on and she and I were at a party together uh, three weeks ago. <laughs> and I said, she mm -hmm. said she was going to Lisbon. And I said, oh my gosh, I have the perfect book for you. Mm -hmm. So she read your book on the way and while she was in Lisbon. Oh, that's yes. so awesome. Oh, it was I, I, I wish I could do that with all the books, but I, I told Cindy, I would, I would have loved your book regardless, but the fact I started reading before I went to Lisbon, I kept reading in Lisbon and then we went somewhere else and it just all came to life. Oh, and I, I saw the places you mentioned and it's just, uh, it was incredible. Oh, thank you so much. I'm yes. so absolutely glad that, that my book helped to enrich your experience so much. Yes, Heather. it did. Like I said, I wish I could do that with all the books. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Did you get to go to Sintra by chance? Oh, my goodness. Yes. We did a private tour. Every other castle, every single castle yes. that I went to in Sintra. <laughs> well, it's funny because we had the day and I had, well, I have 19 and 20 year olds and my husband but my middle child is um, my reader. Her name's Emily. And I looked at Emily. Um, I was like, Emily, so we need to come back, just you and I, stay in one of those little villas and read books and explore all the palaces. That would be like a dream vacation. <laughs> so, awesome. And we'll I leave the boys that. at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no boys allowed. So it was incredible. Very magical. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions they want to ask? I just
just have one more quick comment, Cindy, um, about the passages about hunger. I mean, that was, it just kind of blew me away. I mean, I, I read so much historical fiction and especially during wars. And I just, I was curious what informed your writing on that subject because it was so descriptive and powerful and it just threaded through the entire story to the very end when he's holding the strawberry jam jar. I mean, I just fell apart when that Aww. like came together because you just, you felt the desperation throughout all those pages. Thank you. Uh, you know, honestly, it came from the firsthand accounts. Um, there were so many, and that's where I, I prefer to do most of my research is you know, I, I do a lot of historians' perspectives, but I really, um, I really delve into the firsthand accounts because I feel like it helps you put your fingers on the pulse of what the mood is of the culture. What are the people really responding to? What are they thinking? Um, you know, and and the overriding theme of every single firsthand account that I read of people in France during World War II was hunger. How hungry they were. How much they thought about food. How much they dreamt about food and how the Germans would just, they would eat everything and they would leave things on their plate. And if you tried to get it, they could shoot you. I mean, you know, it really, really was horrible. You know, and then on, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have Lisbon and Lisbon has this, you know, I don't wanna say abundance of food because, you know, there was still a war going on. Like they couldn't go totally crazy, but they really didn't have any restrictions. Um, at one point, I think there actually was a little bit of a ration but it was, it was such a blip in their history that I actually couldn't find any information about it. Even when I did research, I tried to, to research it in Portuguese and translate it and I still couldn't find any real information mm. on it. Um, but so there really was not a limitation as to what people could consume in Lisbon or uh, yeah, in Lisbon. So, you know, when I was writing this book, I, I almost kind of went at it with the approach of make, make their mouths water in Lisbon and remind them of how hungry they are in France and really have that sort of dichotomy flip back and forth between the chapters, um, you know, to really drive home that point. But, but yeah, unfortunately in France, I mean, they were, they were starving. So, well, and I think that you really did a great job, not only with the food and the flipping back and forth, but also like how dangerous Elaine's job was compared to Ava's. You know, there was just this kind of constant comparison of the two. Both were doing great work, but the difference in living in Portugal and living in France. And, you know, it was just scary to walk down the street in France and the Nazis could constantly, you know, they were shooting people and knocking people down and beating people up. And that it was just a lot more dangerous in France than it was in Portugal. Oh yeah, definitely. And even, um, you know, even with, um, oh gosh, now my brain is like totally blinking. Um, her friend who ended up having the nervous breakdown. Oh is that God. or something? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so sorry that I, my brain is like totally blanked on that. Um, but yeah, her having that sort of nervous breakdown, there were many people with the French resistance who had these nervous breakdowns. Um, and so the reason why I had her character have that happen was because that was a very real thing that, that, that did occur where, you know, I mean, because the stress of it, it was so intense. It was, you know, when you would sleep at night and you would hear a bump in the middle of the night, oh my gosh, are the Nazis coming? Did they catch me? You know, it was, it was this constant sense of always being on high alert. Um, and, and that was really for some people, it, they just unraveled. They couldn't handle the constant pressure of it. So. I don't think I could. I think that would be so stressful. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine, especially if you think about the fact that you are undernourished, you're probably, you know, you're probably not well rested because you're not sleeping well at night. And then you're going out and you have this constant paranoia of like, oh my gosh, am I going to be caught and killed? And is my family going to be caught and killed because of me? You know, are they going to torture me and, and my family to get information? Having that, you know, in the back of your mind constantly, I mean, pfft, I don't know if I could do it. And, it. and it really just, it calls to light how heroic the efforts are of so many of these people. Um, you know, it just, it just really is absolutely amazing. Um, and even, you know, with the men that she worked with, um, you know, uh, just like even the person who ran the printing press and how like he had to, they, they actually gave up their children for adoption. That actually happened. 
they gave up their children for adoption as soon as they were born to keep them from, you know, really being able to be used against them to turn in information. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's incredible what these people, what these people lived through and what they sacrificed for the greater good. Absolutely. Well, and I think even, you know, everything you're describing, but also you really can't trust anyone. You, you probably feel like you can trust your printing press people, but, you know, even at that point, somebody gives them up. You really can't trust anyone. And that feeling had to just be so isolating. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really wasn't anything. Well, you couldn't have people come over for dinner anyways, unless they, they brought over their ration, <laughs> which, you know, makes things a little awkward sometimes. But, but, you know, you also, yeah, you really couldn't trust anybody. It's, it's really interesting, you know, in some cases, they even had family members who were in the resistance and neither one of them actually even knew it. Um, they both thought that the other person was completely oblivious to the fact that they were in the resistance, even though they were really actually operating in the same network. Probably, they probably may have even mentioned each other with a code name and not even known that it was them because it, you really even kept it from your family. So if you were, you know, you could be keeping it from your husband, your son, you know, whatever. Um, which, which just really is incredible to think about the depth of, of how secretive you really had to be about this sort of operation. Definitely. Lynette, did you have yeah. a question? I'm sorry. I know. Did not. I was snacking up now. Nah, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure if you did, I hadn't skipped you. <laughs> well, can you tell us a little bit about your new book, the one you just were traveling to Warsaw for? Yes. So, um, and thank you for asking. Um, so the next book is called The Keeper of Hidden Books. And um, it is available or it's uh, the want to read is actually on Goodreads. Um, so I'll be posting little updates there whenever I get anything, but you're forewarned that it has no cover and no blurb. Uh, <laughs> but it'll all eventually be coming. Um, but basically it's about two best friends. Um, one of them will end up in the Warsaw ghetto and the other one will be on the Polish side. And, um, and it's really going to be a lot about, um, initially when the ghetto opened up, they were not allowed to have any libraries in the ghetto. And so people were operating with their libraries outside of suitcases that they would take their own personal library and they would share with everyone else. Um, and there was even a children's um, orphanage library that was um, being run as a children's sort of like playroom um, where they would hide all of the books underneath the toys and everything. And so it really is a lot about, you know, what, what books mean um, in really difficult times like that. But then also on, you know, the Polish side as well, the Nazis tried so hard to culture. So there was no singing, there was no music, there, all the libraries were closed. Uh, a lot of books were being burned. Um, you know, there were, there were no plays or orchestras allowed. And so they had this whole thriving underground um, organization going on where they had all of this culture brought to life. And so, um, so it really is going to be a lot of that. Um, I don't know if I described that very well, but I haven't put it together super great in my head. It's, it's still like <laughs> a huge amount of plot points all over the place. Like my, like my editor said, it's a lot. <laughs> So <laughs> well, you just got back to, and I'm sure you're kind of focused on this one as well. Oh yeah. And, and my brain too is, is at that sort of, um, you know, cause I'm just now starting to really write the keeper of hidden books. And so my brain is exploding with all of the various possibilities. I have it all, um, all plotted out, but you know, until I really start actually getting those words on the page, it, it still is like, oh, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, you know, it's like all directions. <laughs> You'll have to see what'll work and what won't. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and my but editor will ask for anything else that doesn't. <laughs> yes, exactly. You can save all that. Well, does anybody else have any questions before I ask the last one? Nope. Okay. Uh, what have you been reading? Oh, goodness. Um, well, a ton of nonfiction. <laughs> um, right now, I'm also currently reading The Three Lives of um, Alexis St. Pierre, I think, by Natasha Lester. That's coming out in a few months. That is so, so good. Um, I recently also just read um, The Winter Orphans by Kristen Beck. Um, that was amazing. That's also coming out soon. So if you guys haven't had a chance to read that, oh, it's like such a like grab your heart kind of story for sure. Um, and I am reading The Portrait of Dorian Gray because I haven't read it before. Um, and let me think. I have a lot of books that I'm constantly reading. Do you um, get asked to blurb a lot? 
Um, I do, yes. But, you know, I have to be honest, as a reader, it's like the best job ever <laughs> because I get to read these incredible books by amazing authors who I've always looked up to. Um, and I get to read them before anybody else does. And, you know, like I've always been a super huge fan of Kelly Rimmer. And um, so I got to read her next book, The German Wife, which actually comes out at the end of this month, um, like a couple months ago. And it was so good. I completely devoured it in, in one weekend. Um, and then so she had read my blurb around the same time and she wrote back and she called me brilliant with my book. And I was like, oh, fangirl moment. Oh, my gosh. Kelly Rimmer just said I was brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, so it's definitely been like a really um, just incredible sort of, of thing getting to not only you know have people read my book but but getting to read all of those books in advance is like a total bookworm's dream come true so yeah <laughs> well good well thank you so much Madeline for joining us I feel like we learned a ton and loved your book and can't wait to see everybody else talking about it when it comes out in the world Oh, thank you so much again for having me. It was so great to chat with all of you. And if anybody has any questions that pop up later, I mean, feel free to shoot me a message on uh, any of my social media accounts or my, um, my website or anything else. So thank you guys so much. And thank you for reading my book. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It was really fun. Have a great thank night. You. Have a good thank night. You. Bye. Bye.